I would request Dr. Sanjeev Mittal, Dr. Recording start. Dr. Ravi Mahajan to please come forward and take your seats. Thank you. We are a bit late for this very important session actually. So I don't think Dr. Jatin Mehta need any introduction. We will be talking about the echocardiography, role of echocardiography. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed a pleasure to be here. Thanks Vivek and Shaikh also coming. This is the last meeting I hosted in uh, New Delhi. Robert Bartlett as a chief guest. I was the organizing secretary. Okay. So this is what I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, how do you select your patients? What, how do you monitor them? Uh, the complications, correct placement of cannoli. Uh, so basically what do you assess when you put a patient on ECMO? Well, you look at the ventricular function. First of all, you have to Make sure if the ventricular function is okay or not. Is it a hypovolemic uh, ventricle or is it a poorly contractile? Um, uh, myocardium, as um, the cardiologist, caused a problem during the procedure and caused a tempo dart. Also, look for regional wall motion and anomaly, anomalies. And in P, you look at the right atrial pressure. And So, what are the contraindications? First of all, I must thank all of you because I'm pretty impressed at 6 o'clock in the evening, people are sitting here in the hall. Uh, Delhi, you, you will not find people like this. Anyway, so what, what you look at is you have to rule out when you should not do a procedure. So when you should not be putting that patient on echo, the aortic dissection is an absolute contraindication. Uh, significant aortic regurgitation, obviously the ECMO, VA ECMO is not going to work and a significant peripheral vascular disease. And this is one of the patients with the aortic dissection which you can easily diagnose on a, um, on, on a transesophageal or a transthoracic echo. Um, and also you can uh, look at the flow of the true and the false flow. So when there is a when you should not put a VV echo, well, if a patient has severe a severe pulmonary hypertension, then it is better to put a patient on uh, VA ECMO. And once you unload the right ventricle, then the left ventricle also benefits with that. So that is important. Now here you can see the transesophageal views, both chamber view on the left side. There and that's a 3D view of the same, and then that's a bicable view, and you can see the uh, ASD there. So placement of the cannula is where that is. Uh, these views are uh, looked at. We have to rule out certain uh, congenital cardiac anomalies where uh, this would cause a problem, particularly the ASDs where the shunting would increase, including uh, interatrial septal aneurysms, uh, foot pit and foramen nouvelle, butchery network, and obviously. Uh, uh, recently placed ICD or pacemaker virus is relative problem. Now here you can see, you can see the assess the flow across the PFO, so that is okay, but this is a large ASD, so this will cause problems if you have to put the um, patient on ECMO. Now when you look at the insertion of the cannula, this is a significant help, and here you can see most of us, all of us would be ultrasound guided, so you can do the same top the machine, and you can see the wire going in there. And the placement of the bicable cannula, you can see the atrial septum there, and there's the SVC and there's the IVC, and you can see the placement of the of the cannula there. And this is a short axis of the aorta. You can see the wire going in there, and you can see the flow across. Uh, what are the complications? Well, uh, you have to the cannula may go into the wrong place. If there's a PFO, it will go through that. To the interatrial septum, you were obviously you were looking at the positioning. It may go into the coronary sinus. It may go through the tricuspid uh, valve. Um, so you have to make sure it is okay. I will not get it now. You have to look at the correct positioning again, and um, uh, echo is necessary for looking at the positioning. Uh, again, where venous cannula is normally in the mid right atrium for optimal blood flow. Peripheral arterial cannula cannot be visualized, uh, but uh, you can see the guide wire when you, it goes to, to the ascending, ascending aorta. And here you can see the guide wire. Okay, and here again you can see the single stage, you know, spectral cannula, you can see the tip. And here the multi stage, that you can see here, this is the liver. And you can see the aorta again. Here, the aortic valve, and you can see the uh, cannula going in. You can put a Doppler and see the flow that is uh, correctly placed. 
Mid uh, for the VV ECMO, the return cannula should be in the mid right atrium. Again, you should be able to visualize it, and the access cannula in the proximal uh, IVC, and obviously a doctor will detect the flow there. I'm running through my talk because my the next talk, the gentleman has to catch Dr. Shah has to catch a flight. Uh, unfortunately, I have a meeting which has already begun, the executive meeting, so I couldn't uh, oblige him. Again, when you look at the recirculation, again, ECMO is where you can uh, assess it. Uh, you can look, look at myocardial injury, uh, you can look at the contractility, and obviously reconfirm your position. Now, this is where the IVC cannula, you can see, is going uh, to the right atrium, to the IVC. The distance between the two cannulae, again, you can assess it on ECMO, it should be more than 10 centimeters. Um, and cannula do migrate. I have one patient just now, uh, the surgeon had pulled out the cannula a bit, and then Again, on the check, uh, uh, echo it had migrated. So you need to keep on readjusting it. Here you can see again people with IVC uh, going into the right atrium. Again, the same thing again on a different view. During the support, what does one uh, monitor? Okay. So, how do you monitor patient on peripheral echo? You can see. The left ventricular and diastolic volume. Now, this is no, not a moving picture, otherwise, you'll be able to appreciate it. The contractility is not very good. Uh, there is a mitral regurgitation also. And so, ventricle is not adequately unloaded in this sort of a situation. You had a previous uh, talk by Dr. Ahmed of what to do in that sort of a situation. So, obviously, if you're insufficient, uh, insufficient loading of the ventricle, you can get pulmonary congestion, average um, myocardial contract injury can still get worse. Um, and I've had injury can get worse. Again, you can see uh, inadequate uh, adequate uh, unloading of the right atrium, uh, right ventricle, which is empty. Uh, left ventricle contractility obviously is significantly impaired. And here again, this is a 15 year old uh, male with acute myocarditis and a peripheral uh, VA ECMO, day one. He was an IABP plus inotropes, but there's adequate unloading of the ventricle here. Again, short axis, you can confirm it. Uh, this is a, 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 you can see the contractility whether the ventricle, uh, which wall is not moving very well. If the ventricle is unloading is inadequate, then obviously you'll have to, to do something to correct that. And these are the different procedures which you can do, which again has been uh, talked about by uh, Amit. Again, this is quite gross, you can see here. The sec in the left ventricle and left atrium, so this inadequate unloading of the left ventricle. Uh, so you will have to do something to, to correct that. And here again, you can see nicely emptying the two ventricular walls are kissing each other. So this is adequate uh, uh, emptying of the ventricle, adequate unloading of the ventricle. So this is uh, satisfactory. This was a, a two years old female with myocarditis and uh, central VA go for 30 days, use it in bridge to recovery. Now, this is a hepatic vein and IVC. You can see that here. Uh, and you can look at the flow of the cannula. Venous pressure, if it should be uh, um, uh, adequate but not too much, then you'll see the venous congestion and the IVC was uh, not collapsing. So, adequate venous pressure is uh, unloading the hepatic vein flow. You can put a Doppler there. You can see there. And it goes with the adequate loading of the unloading. And obviously, mixed venous saturation. Uh, does help in ventricular contractility as well as improving the oxygen flow. It also decreases the peripheral pulmonary vascular resistance and therefore right ventricular afterload is reduced and the right ventricular unloading will get, get better. One dreaded thing with the ECMOs are the complications which can be related to all any of these things, cannula complications, circuit complications, bleeding, thrombosis, oxygenator and bladder. Here you can see an LV thrombus. This is a, 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 a 3D. Again, you can see it. Again, you can see a thrombus on the long axis of the aorta. This is about the aortic valve there. And this is a short axis. Again, you can see a thrombus over the aortic valve. Then, IVC obstruction can happen. It will lead to uh, obviously peripheral congestion and the uh, worst is the liver congestion. Uh, if there's an SVC obstruction, then obviously it will lead to um, uh, SVC syndrome. And here, here you can see the flow is not adequate here, and then there's a collapse there. 
So it's obstruction to the IVC. Tamponade can happen, particularly in the cath lab disasters. IVI always for uh, for that. And here you can see a significant collection here, and uh, and here also you can see all around the heart is a significant collection. So that will have to probably be the big the train. Patient can develop thrombosis in the valves. You have to rule out the hit in these patients. <coughs> Again, you can see uh, there's RA thrombus here. This is a 3D picture. And again, you can see sudden cast around the uh, around the Kerala here. Mm -hmm. Again, this is an eccentric mitral regurgitation jet there. It is not adequate to unloading of the ventricle. The right ventricle is unloaded, but the left ventricle has distended here. Um, and this was a balloon septostomy to decompress the left ventricle. Again, you can see it in a bicable view, the septostomy balloon. This is severe RV dysfunction, you can see. The RV is uh, dilated, LV is okay, the septum is pushed to the, to the left and compromising the left ventricular ejections also. RV is also dilated. And after winning, you can see the RV is reasonably empty. So this is one of the signs that the, that the patient is ready for, for breathing. And this is an image on which you can't see anything. So if the quality of your image is not good, don't make your therapy based on inadequate imaging. When does one, uh, uh, when you start winning from the ECMO, then certain uh, criteria have to be met. ECMO criteria is LV function should be about 35 to 40 percent. LV diameter and diastole should be less than 55. Aortic velocity uh, should be uh, uh, the VTI should be more than 10 centimeters and uh, look at the aortic valve opening and LV should not be uh, dilated. Here there is a large hematoma compressing the right ventricle. So you can use screening criteria for bridge to transplant or bridge to decision making or bridge to LVI. So decreasing the echo support determines reduction of LV afterload and increase in LV preload which you can assess with echocardiography. Um, unfortunately, conventional echo parameters are dependent on uh, loading conditions, and that is where some certain new technology can come into play. So the echo is basically fundamental at the time of cannulation to assess the positioning of the correct positioning, at daily surveillance, so you must do a daily echo, recovery of the heart to just take a decision on weaning of the, um, the echo support, and look for complications of echo. Uh, uh, tissue doppler imaging is becoming quite fashionable, but obviously you require proper training for that, but that is load ind independent, so to accurately assess your left ventricular function and recovery of the function, I think tissue doppler imaging uh, has an important role to play. Artifacts can be generated, you must keep that in mind. Uh, image intensifier at times may uh, overcome these drawbacks. X-ray is not that accurate because most of the cannula they are not radio opaque. There are no specific protocols available for echo criteria for weaning. They are grossly available, but SOPs are not there. Uh, so basically, you have to look at the holistic picture of oxygenation and contractility and other functions of the patients to take a decision. So echo is mandatory during initiation of echo, cannula insertion, hemodynamic monitoring, detecting complications during echo. It's an essential monitoring tool in the care of patients on ECMO, and further investigation and guidelines should help delineate its use for patients on ECMO. So I thank you very much for your support. I think if the chairperson's permit, I'll be happy to answer one or two questions, and then I'm ready for them. Yes, yes sir. Sir. Dr. Shah will be quite happy to answer my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you everyone. Uh, apologies, I'm in a bit of a rush. So I'm going to go through this talk. Um, uh, so there are no conflict of interest. I'm talking about hyperbilirubinemia on ECMO. Um, so I thought while writing this talk, where should I start? First I was cursing Pranay to give me this topic. 
what am I going to talk about? But then I realized that you know we've got all chance to shine in yellow by talking about hyperbilirubinemia. So I thought I'd start with basics. So let's start with basic physiology. Let's go back to our medical school. Majority of, of, of bilirubin is generated from hemoglobin. So we all know that hemoglobin gets broken down into him and globin. And him gets further degraded by hemoxygenation into pre-iron, uh, glo- um, uh, carbon monoxide, and biliverdin. The biliverdin then gets converted into bilirubin. Now whatever bilirubin which stays within the, 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 the blood circulation gets cleaved with albumin. So there's two albumin molecules for a molecule of bilirubin and they, they get cleaved uh, in, in the blood circulation. But the bilirubin which gets absorbed by the hepatocyte has to be converted into a water soluble compound where it goes into uh, uh, ATP uh, uh, mediated pathway and it gets uh, uh, glucuronidated with the glucuronin transferase. So it gets converted into bilirubin diglucronide, which is a water soluble component which gets secreted into bile and then finally enters the intestine where the gut bacteria converts it into stercobilin and majority of it gets ex- uh, excreted through, through feces. Some of which makes way back into, into, into liver through enterohepatic recirculation and only one person gets uh, eliminated through urine. Now about um, a gram of hemoglobin will generate about 30 milligrams of bilirubin and in total about 200 to 250 milligrams of bilirubin is generated per day in the body. So that's the basic physiology around bilirubin. So what are the causes of high bilirubin? Again, going back to basics, I have divided them into prehepatic, intrahepatic and post-hepatic causes. The prehepatic causes mainly are driven by hemolysis and the hemolysis could be caused by any any cause which causes hemolysis, whether it could be infection, whether it is drug driven or whether it is uh, device driven. Uh, and it causes mostly uh, unconjugated or indirect bilirubinemia, where the bilirubin is still not water soluble. The intrahepatic causes are any cause which can cause direct damage to the hepatic cell, which could be drugs, toxins, sepsis, uh, anything, or it could be congenital. And the post hepatic is mostly, mostly the obstructive cause, which would be either strong or, or, or a tumor. So, why are we worried about high bilirubin? Now, there are causes of liver insert in, in ICU. Um, again, uh, a point of interesting uh, uh, thing that there is a lack of a unifying definition what defines what is acute hepatic failure on ICU. Now, we start with uh, acute liver injury, which is mostly hypoxia driven, which is, which is, which is characterized by um, transaminitis. And majority of the time, if the correct interventions are put in place, then there is a, a very good chance of, of recovery. Now, most of the causes of, of liver damage um, on ICU are either hypoxic or sepsis driven or uh, related to total parental nutrition or drugs. If you move down to acute hepatic dysfunction, that's where the problem starts. Acute hepatic dysfunction is characterized by the problem with the synthetic function of the liver and hence you know, once the patient goes into that 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 uh, uh, category, then you'll start seeing the increase in mortality, which is much much higher in acute hepatic failure, uh, and most of the patients won't survive without a transplant. Uh, just to to sort of you know uh, understand, you know, what are the different classifications of drug induced liver injury it depends on how you monitor them. So if you are monitoring them clinically, then you know it could be either hepatocellular or cholestatic, depending on the blood results. Or if you if you go by the mechanism, then either it is direct, idiosyncratic, or, or metabolic, or immune mediated. Or if you have got a chance to get a biopsy done, then you can you can categorize the, the drug-induced liver injury. And this gives an example of various categories of drugs which um, can cause uh, uh, liver injury and the mechanism by which it can cause liver injury. By no means this is a complete list, but this is just an example. These are most of the common drugs which are used on a day-to-day basis in intensive care, mainly things like uh, antifungals, anti-infective agents, uh, things like amiodarone, paracetamol and stuff. So, is bilirubin a prognostic marker for critical illness? We've not even touched base with extracorporeal life support. We're just talking about critically ill patient. And of course it is. So I've just uh, uh, mentioned two papers. 
which are retrospective analysis. So the paper on the right, uh, which is a retrospective cohort study from South Korea, um, they looked at their patients who were admitted in ICU with excessive uh, hyperbilirubinemia. This uh, excessive hyperbilirubinemia is the bilirubin level of greater than 10 milligrams per deciliter. And they graded them into four grades of grade one, two, and three, four, um, in the sense that, you know, from 10 to 15, 15 to 20, 20 to 30, and greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter. And when they looked on their analysis, they said that the, the serial mortality went up as the stage of hyperbilirubinemia or excessive hyperbilirubinemia increased from stage one to stage four. In the next study, the, 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 the authors, again, a retrospective study of over 700 patients, uh, compare uh, uh, a bilirubin to uh, albumin ratio. Now we know that in sickness, uh, most of the patients uh, will have high bilirubin, high bilirubin or hyperbilirubinemia and low albumin levels. And as the ratio increased, there was a serial increase in mortality. And hence, you know, the, the, the bilirubin to albumin ratio can be one of the prognostic markers of outcome in critical care in critically ill patients. So what about extracorporeal life support? Now I'm talking in an ELSO conference, so I pretty much cannot get away without mentioning the ELSO registry. So the ELSO registry here defines uh, high bilirubin or hyperbilirubinemia, moderate hemolysis and severe hemolysis as metabolic complications of patients being on ECMO and they're coded as well you can see on the, on the right. So the high bilirubin, I'll stick to the adult patient because that's my practice. And the total bilirubin of greater than 170 micromoles per liter, which is greater, greater than 10 milligrams per deciliter, is defined as hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, um, moderate hemolysis or the hemolysis, we're talking in terms of plasma free hemoglobin. And any level of 50 to 100 milligrams per deciliter of plasma, peak plasma hemoglobin on two consecutive days in, in a single run on extracorporeal life support is considered to be moderate hemolysis. Anything greater than 100 on a two consecutive day is considered to be severe hemolysis. So the definition is relatively clear here. So why is it important? So I'm sure everyone has heard about the, 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 the SAVE uh, prognostic uh, uh, or predicting outcome uh, SAVE scoring for, for VA ECMO. And the SAVE scoring also mentions liver failure as one of their scoring criteria. So what I've done on the right is that I've created a hypothetical patient. At the top, the, the patient has got liver failure. The rest of the, the characteristics remain the same. So their safe score is three. And you can see on the curve, the survival is somewhere between sort of 45 to 60%. When I take the liver failure out from the scoring so that the patient is not in liver failure, this is a hypothetical patient. The safe score is doubled. And you can see the survival goes up from 45 to 60 percent to about 60 to 80 percent in that patient. So you can see why it is important high bilirubin in, in extracorporeal life support. So uh, let's talk about ARDS and VVA. Now I always believed that a high bilirubin, um, uh, starting high bilirubin before putting the patient on ECMO is bad, but not necessarily according to this, this uh, study. So it is the, 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 the trend over the next two or three days which is important. If over the next two or three days, if the bilirubin starts falling, then not necessarily starting with high bilirubin is a, is a bad thing, especially in VVF patients with, with, with ARDS. What about hemolysis then? So again, again, hemolysis is a problem, but we don't know the exact incidence of hemolysis because people sometimes just ignore and they don't report according to the, the and so the definition and the criteria but incidence can be up to 40 percent so close to about half of the patients will end up with some kind of hemolysis on vv ecmo so this is this is again uh, a systematic review on ards patients receiving vv ecmo now the survivors will always show a quite a low incidence of hemolysis uh, as expected the, the this systemic uh, review uh, mentioned uh, the the pump head thrombosis high blood flow, so running them on a very, very high blood flow, and a dual lumen cannula, which is more associated with hemolysis than, than other cannula or cannulation configuration. Now, there is some suggestion, and I'm sure a lot of centers cut in 
um, uh, renal replacement uh, filters within the ECMO circuits, uh, which we don't do it um, uh, at our institution, but there is some suggestion that they may be related to increased incidence of, of hemolysis um, in this, in this uh, group of patients. Now, what this systemic review did not look at is the duration of the runs of ECMO and the quality of the red cell which were transfused and also the disease severity, which is something you know needs to be taken into consideration when you consider hemolysis uh, or VV ECMO. <coughs> this is all about VV, but what about VA ECMO? Um, the only paper I could find out about VA ECMO was the post-cardiotomy VA ECMO. And we know that you know the post-cardiotomy along with ECPR are pre predominantly the most sickest of the VA ECMO patients you, you can sort of come across with sort of very, very uh, poor or very, very um, um, guarded prognosis on, on, on those patients. So in this paper, they, they find, found out that again, it was a retrospective analysis, a high alkaline uh, phosphatase and a high bilirubin was associated with poor outcome in these patients, along with other criteria uh, like diabetes, obesity, um, and renal uh, dysfunction. So, Moving on, I think we have to take into account certain special circumstances as well. Patients with sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait, they can hemolyze a lot on, on extracorporeal circuits, uh, infections, and uh, I've experienced an atypical infection uh, patient with mycoplasma who would hemolyze, and it is quite known, uh, although rare, but they, they can do. Certain immuno, uh, autoimmune conditions can do that, and in uh, cardiac patients, prostatic valves, uh, can be a, 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 a big of a problem once the patient starts hemolyzing. So, uh, what is the cl clinical re relevance of hemolysis? We've seen the clinical relevance of bilirubin, but what's the clinical re relevance relevance of hemolysis? So, this is a nice paper where you know they've just enumerated uh, all the studied studies in a in a table to to understand the clinical importance of hemolysis. Um, and it is a wide variety of, of patients, including pediatrics, post cardiotomy, uh, some uh, VV ECMO patients, and a medical VA ECMO patients. And the take home message is that any kind of hemolysis is a morbid condition. So the morbidity can be in terms of uh, increased requirement of renal replacement, and also it sort of shows indication towards uh, poor outcome. Um, it is quite difficult uh, to determine the prevalence, as I said, within the, the, the ECLS uh, population, the prevalence of hemolysis. It is there. Some studies say it's up to 40%. And there is no robust data where, you know, the propensity of causing hemolysis, whether it is more in VV or VA or either, either way around. So how do we, do we measure hemolysis? The, the clinical uh, manifestations of low intensity hemolysis is quite difficult to ascertain. Uh, most of the patients are sick and clinical signs of hypotension, shivering, agitation, etc. are quite delayed or you may not be able to ascertain them that because they are, most of the time they are asleep. Uh, jaundice is a late onset and I think by the time the jaundice, jaundice is, is, is seen in the patient clinically, I think they will move further down the lane. Um, you may see changes in the urine color or your uh, effluent color might change uh, if they are on renal replacement therapy. By and large, we are dependent on the biological markers to, to uh, uh, ascertain the hemolysis. LDH, again, it's not reliable, it's not very specific. Uh, phosphate probably will increase and there will decrease in heptoglobin and, and hemoglobin. By far, Plasma-free hemoglobin is key in monitoring uh, hemolysis in patients on extracorporeal life support. Now, having said so, the plasma-free hemoglobin may not be a readily available uh, marker at uh, quite a lot of institutions. So, hence, there are some sort of uh, suggestion that carboxyhemoglobin might be an early indicator, especially of, of a membrane or compact thrombosis. So, if you recollect what I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the heme gets uh, degraded by heme oxygenase into iron, uh, carboxy carbon monoxide um, and biliverdin. So this carbon monoxide, as we all know, has got a very, very high affinity to hemoglobin. So an increase in carboxy hemoglobin, you may be able to see 24, 48 hours earlier than you would expect your plasma free hemoglobin or stuff can uh, starts increasing. So there is a, 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 a renewed sort of interest in, in uh, looking at serial carboxyhemoglobin, which is uh, 
uh, which is uh, which is uh, a work in progress, uh, and this needs to be uh, scientifically uh, validated. So, how to manage hemolysis on ECMO? So, if 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 the circuit is a problem, then obviously you know you have to either change the pump, change the membrane, or change the circuit itself. Um, and then you know, depending on the on the cause, you have to treat the cause. So, if they go into renal failure, you have to manage them with renal replacement therapy. Um, and, and so on. They may need blood transfusion if the hemoglobin is dropping due to any reason, um, and, 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 and uh, so on. So, in summary, um, liver uh, dysfunction is important in critically ill patients. Hyperbilirubinemia is associated with poor outcome. Incidence of hemolysis uh, on ECMO is, is, is variable, but can be up to 40%. Hyperbilirubinemia or, or hemolysis is associated with morbidity and mortality in ECLS population and management risk course specific. I'm going to take one or two questions and uh, if, if that is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so we would like, now like to invite Dr. Vinayak Patki. He was sitting with me. I didn't realize such a thing man is sitting with me. So, Dr. Patsky is the Director of the Pediatric ICU, Abhinav Institute of Medical Sciences, Sangli, and he has done a lot of work as a pediatric intensivist. And he will be talking on, so please introduce the topic. Sitting here till for this talk. So, what I am going to talk about uh, monitoring during ECMO transport, what are the need and challenges. This topic is given the uh, requested by Pranay sir. So, first of all, greetings from my institute. Uh, this is uh, UIMS. Uh, what I'm going to talk about this in a different way. So what are the current situation? What are the challenges? How we can post this? How we can face this? And how we can improve overall condition in the India, especially critical care itself is a complex thing. Once you patient put on ECMO, it becomes more complex, and you want to shift the patient on ECMO for transport, it becomes more complex. As the complexity increases, the challenges become difficult. And the outcome depends on the team and your experience and how you are prepared for that. So evolution has been, uh, this is, uh, Parlet has way back in 1977 has put the experience of putting ECMO at remote hospital and bringing back. Then uh, Dr. Cornish has over 1986 to 91 almost has published uh, transporting high risk neonet. And 2014 Viner has published a two decade experience. And what he concluded that interfacility transport on ECMO is feasible and can be accomplished safely in a critical year. And survival is basically made is, is, is almost same uh, in age matched and treatment matched ECMO patient at large. So there are this is no need to say this is a any patient on ECMO either has to be transported in intra-hospital for either for CT or procedures or intra-hospital transport can be primary, secondary and tertiary primary based on you do ECMO outside, bring back to your center. Secondary, you have already ignored and you are shifting for another facility and tertiary. Maybe some team goes at hospital, does ECMOs and transport to another specialty. As we know, there are a lot of uh, options, but as far as India is concerned, limited options are there. What important things determines the transport system is noise, distance, space, weight, and last but not least is the cost. So this is a different, uh, different uh, comparison between ground ambulance, helicopter and fixed wing aircraft. COVID has seen a lot of uh, things related to this kind of transfer. Next thing what I am going to talk about the challenges and whenever you try to do some articulate task, it is a immense challenge to go for it. And these challenges are different and this just I have, this is our paper, uh, this is under, still under publication. This is under, uh, we have done almost 11 states of India, 22 centers and 450 locations. And what we found the cost of transport is the most important challenge. Then availability of air ambulance followed by interstate and of course it was in COVID area. And more important thing is safety of transport for COVID. This was again, so this is something data we are, this is under publication. But what I feel, uh, these are four threes, availability, accessibility, affordability and complications. So these are the four limiting factors as far as liability factors and challenges as far as ECMO transport is concerned. As far as even availability limited ECMO centers, limited mobile ECMO units, limited ECMO ambulances 
and most important thing is limited experience about transporting ECMO patient. As far accessibility is concerned, limited information is there as far as Indian data is concerned. Traffic congestion and road conditions still there. They are improving but has to go for a long way. And very important thing is affordability. Then when, even if all these things are there, like you, what is limiting or most challenging part is complications. That will be equipment related, patient related, environment related and logistic or technical. We will see one by one. Equipment related, lot of things can happen during the transport tube chattering because of movement, vibration, camera can move and have caused bleeding, minor circuit, leakage and connectors, so pump failure can go, oxygenator failure can go, centrifugal and there is excess of because of electromagnetic force in the air, you can have lot of equipment challenge challenges also. Then there are a lot of environment in uh, transport is different and it's more challenging for it. Noise can create hearing loss, communication problem, alarms can miss, vibration can dislodge tubes and lines, acceleration and deacceleration during the transport can cause medical device movement and as well as patient movement and decrease atmosphere cause expansion of pneumothorax and which are more likely to create more problem. There is decreased humidity, the visual impairment is there. There is decreased temperature when you transport in a very cold areas and very important thing is limited working space and unknown space, new space causes decision difficulty. That makes the ECMO more problematic and more challenging. Then there are impact patient related issues also because of dryness of secretions, eyes respite tag, gas expansion in uh, potential tube spaces, more, more vascular permeability, ET tube can rupture, you can have arrhythmias, hypotension, and if especially in cold atmosphere, you can get a hypothermia. Then you can have a logistic issue, like, like delay in referral, arrival, initiation, shortage of personnel, shortage of aircraft, shortage of ambulances, inadequate, inadequate communication, coordination between the referring and receiving teams, there can be power supply, battery exhaustion, and very important thing is human error. That can affect because somebody forgets in something and creates more problem and when it is more likely required. How safe? What is, is there any data of ECMO transport? What are the challenges? How, what is common thing? What? So this just I will reviewed in few slides. I will. has been from. This is a data for almost 2010 to 2016. This is adverse during intra-hospital transport. And what they found is almost 550 patients. So patient related problems was there almost uh, almost 20 percent. And most common problem what they found is loss of time volume followed by loss of uh, this hypovolemia. Then this is Mendicital from this was first study was from Sweden, this is from Brazil and this is a systematic review analysis with their tertiary care experience and what these are a big data, 38 articles, almost more than 1500 patients, both pediatric and as well as uh, adult and what they found is most important thing is uh, what happens is only two days so there is not much 0.1% and tidal volume fall again as a 4%. So tidal volume fall is a more important factor. So this is from, so this is data from Scotland. They also found same thing, a bleeding, a loss of volume followed by bleeding. And this is a data from our own uh, professor. And this is published in Qatar Medical Journal. This was a very short data of six years, 45 patients without loss of life and major clinical technical issues during the transports. So this was this is a safe thing if you can do it in a proper manner. So what decides the success of or key aspects of success of ECMO transport. So there are three things, team, training and checklist. This is an interrelated thing, you cannot separate one from other, that's why it is a combined thing. The first coming to team, very important thing you want your team dynamics are there and that team dynamic decides the precise role, precise role allocation, leadership, followership thing and how the task has been given. So cannulating physician should have a proper cannula. They, you can, if you are uh, trying a retrieval of pediatric person, then you should have a pediatric CVT surgeon or ped pediatric intensivist. The ECMO physician has a role of having prompt initiation. And very important thing is his clinical, sufficient clinical experience and judgment to stop ECMO initiation when it is too late. Then you should have ECMO specialist, perfusionist should be there for a proper communication, checklist, functional load rate with departure, management of ECMO, ECMO circuit is that uh, responsibility of ECMO specialist. And nurse take a big role of here of all phases of transport, about medications, IV fluids and blood products. Coming to the training is very, very important and we cannot able to this kind of training, you can only give with simulation. I know this is high fidelity mannequins are very limited in India, so we have to go with 
low fidelity mannequins so what your ecmo uh, uh, objective should be there ventilation circulation and cpr whole oral ecmo care if needed during the transport you should have a realistic situation you should should not go for very rare or remote situation all team members including your team leader of ecmo team should be there stress should be more on communication and team dynamics has to be because this is a complex work has to be carried out by the team debriefing should be very good those centers who do less work should have more debriefed more scenarios and those centers who at least were busy should have at least one to two step simulation per per simulation days per staff per year so what simulation does this is a actually a, a ambulance a thing where transport ambulance you can have see a real simulation in these ambulances also you can create the situation ecmo trend specialist is sitting on the head then ecmo trend uh, therapist the perfusionist tool the ecmo consultant and nurse thing so you can do this simulation and you can make more self you are more uh, uh, more importantly you can refine your things crisis this crm principle has to be i always stress this in all transport things this all these 12 components this is given in all and all of us we are aware of this and this is a crisis situation you should have a call for help anticipate know your environment available information allocate attention mobilize the resources use cognitive aid communicate effectively establish role clarity and uh, designate leadership so all these crisis resource principles needs to be implemented very important coming to the checklist so you should have this is a lsoas 2020 22 april has given a very nice guideline about how you should transport this is taken from that the patient information form has to go to the referring unit and they have to fill before you reach the system then you should have basic checklist like time patients identity what a type of ecmo why you are taking and what is the mode of transport that should be very clear and you should do the very communication is very very important mobile ecmo leader team emergency medical services very important you bed arrangements are there ventilator arrangements are there and very necessary is necessary permissions clearance and for international transport it should be visas and other facilities has to be clear then coming to the what are the referring facility patient preparation you should have a good lines uh, latest laboratory reports cross match blood uh, available imaging and charges everything should be ready at referring facility this is a big list of ecmo transport this is a four or five six points are there related to ecmo but very important thing is you are not only have ecmo you have other critical care transport also so you should have transport ventilation such without go saying ki your connector ventilator to means your pump everything should be backed up with uh, good thing but other important things are like vital cat monitors heating devices portable uc whatever possible things are there it listed and has to be checklisted whether these things are there or not then coming to the pre transport copy of medical records emergency drugs available blood products we require so at least we recommend at least two to four a uh, taxi unit should be there if you are transport especially child ecmo center should be by exact time of arrival time of your uh, transport family contacts and all equipments are there or not has to be there even you reach to this cycle and task to the to your hospital then again has to be endorsement to the in house team this is very important this change over is very important what was their situation before transport what happened during transport and how you are going to take what things have been changed because treating team is totally different till your trunk transport note should be complete so new backup things should be there all equipment should be clean checked and power plug inside new backup circuit and prime things are there if you want to change and again team brief has to be planned what is going to be next whether it is going to go for any procedure whether it is going to go for uh, any supportive management or other things so i'm last part of my discussion is if something happens or We what we should do either is a prevention measure or management hypoxia. We don't try to do anything this manual in a running ambulance. Or few of us have done it for you either high transport or ECMOs. So try to stop somewhere safely and try to analyze the things. Hypoxia is optimized peak effort because you have very limited resources. You can't do all the things during the ECMO transport. Increase your blood flow rates, transfuse blood products. Hypotension is a very important thing. It's circuit check, kink, dislodgements. flow rate has to be proper sweep gas has to be point of care people focus is there you can do what is happening and all vasopressor and iron drops has to be kept at proper level delayed pneumothorax again a very important complication so tube thoracotomy insertion can be done in a uh, safe uh, steady atmosphere tube dislodgement and all that if it is there try to find reinsert 
closest approximate location of the tubes and in fact power failures can be go very uh, so ensure maximum chances of all equipments transport with backup and uh, this, this was taken from ISO 2017 uh, Nicholas Key. So this is the guideline has been published in 2022 as copies there and on ISO website and very detailed manner they have so every center has to have this kind of uh, checklist and things that should be there. So to conclude, intra and intra-hospital ECMO transport should be performed by trained and experienced team only. Transport on ECMO are generally safe if conducted by experienced team. High risk and intermediate threat of situation can occur any time which demands anticipation and prompt corrective actions. Any transport should be preceded by timeout and follow a checklist. Frequent training of transport team by simulation is very much needed and transport algorithm checklist should be used for conducting structure assessment. So to conclude, be prepared for transport, be aware for situation and be ready to transport any situations. Uh, thank you very much for your kindness. So any questions? Uh, thank you Dr. Vatki. We realized the importance of transport during, during COVID. Yes. When patients were initiated on ECMO in the peripheries, then they were brought to a central center because there was severe manpower shortage. Yes. So anybody would like to ask anything? So I think that will be all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity to talk. Thank you. So we'll be concluding this session here. Thank you all of you.